in any group, in any church, in every, every, even every family, sticking together is actually really hard to do. There seems to be this natural sort of entropy in relationships that makes it harder to stay together than it is to, to grow apart. We're still in our study of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. So let's start by reading today's scripture in context from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, which says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now, if you recall last week, I said in chapter uh, 1, verse 27, that it marks a change in attitude, a change in tone in Paul's letter. I equated it to when you were leaving home in your car, your first car trip after you've gotten your driver's license. And the conversation tone sort of shifts where, where it goes from like, oh, you're having, you're going to have such a great time. Boy, it's going to be a wonderful trip. And all of a sudden, your, your mom, your dad, your guardian looks at you dead in the eye and goes, okay, but seriously... And then they give you a bunch of warnings and reminders that, you know, about you and the car and the trip and, and all the rest of that stuff. That, things you need to take seriously. That's sort of the tone that changes in verse 27 too. Paul knows this might be the very last letter he ever sends. And so in our verses today, we see the Apostle Paul, very much the, the father figure for the Philippian church, kind of do that get serious tone about some stuff they, they need to remember. Last week, uh, it was live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, which is a very individual reminder, right? If he was preaching, he'd be scanning the crowd, kind of looking into everyone's eyes and saying, okay, as you live, whether I'm here or not, no matter what happens to me or not, whether I'm here to watch you and babysit you or not, each one of you lives to li uh, needs to live a moral and upright life that honors God. And you look at them all. But then in this next part, he moves from individual to corporate. He goes from telling each person talking to talking to the whole group. Where in the second part of verse 27, he tells them to stand firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side. In other words, as I said last week, his encouragement is the same as any parent would give to any group of kids that were heading off for the first time unsupervised. Be good and stick together. Last week we talked about the be good but today we're going to talk about the stick together. And what's interesting is that in our, our verses today, in chapters one, uh, in chapter two, verses one to two, the tone seems to change a little bit again. In verses 27 to 30, you had that look you dead in the eyes and make sure that you're going to take this thing serious, you know. But this one has a more pleading tone. Let me read it again. So, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. You see, he's making an argument, as he usually does, but he's also pleading with them. He's reminding them. He's connecting with them on an emotional level, giving them a, a good reason to stick together because he knows that in any group, in any church, in every, every, even every family, Sticking together is actually really hard to do. There seems to be this natural sort of entropy in relationships that makes it harder to stay together, uh, harder to stay together than it, than it is to, to grow apart. Maybe you've noticed this in your in your own groups or your friends or your church or even in your home. It's like if you don't do the constant maintenance, if you don't, then those natural forces are gonna cause people to drift away from each other not towards each other but away and it requires effort it requires work sacrifice time to work against those forces to keep the relationship growing and strong i think this whole world like especially our modern world seems to be designed to keep us from forming and maintaining those tight bonds of relationship because there's always work to do and we're not huge fans of doing the work. There's always something broken that needs fixing. There's always something new and interesting we can go check out somewhere else that distracts us from the relationship. There's always some static, some issue, some annoyance that makes the relationship a little bit more difficult than it needs to be. There's always another relationship that might need you, causing you to compromise all the other ones so that you can go deal with that one. 
And then, I mean, if you mix in some mental illnesses like depression, anxiety, social disorder, abuse, PTSD, or just, you know, an introverted personality that makes being with people exhausting, or a very extroverted personality that makes you bounce from person to person, never really getting deep with anyone, all of that makes the maintaining of relationships even harder. Even if you really are great friends, even if you're family members that you love, boyfriend, girlfriend, even a spouse, building and maintaining relationships takes work and we are opposed on every side. Now this is true not only in relationships in our life, but it's true in churches as well. It's true among Christians as well. I mean, people who are supposed to be known for their love for one another, often they really struggle with this whole staying together thing. Uh, Paul knew this, and he knew that not only were there practical realities that were working against them, but spiritual realities too. There, there really is a spiritual enemy that didn't want them to be united, wanted them divided and fighting and jealous of one another and competing with one another because then they weren't going to be a threat to him. They wouldn't be affecting their communities with the gospel because they're too busy biting each other. In other words, the mission of the enemy is to divide and conquer. So what does Paul do here, knowing all that? In, in what might be his last letter to them, he doesn't know, what argument would he make? What big, big gun reason, what rationale does he use to give them this touchstone to do all that work to try to stay together even when he's not there to pay attention, even when he's not there to babysit? What's his big, you know, the big thing he says, this is what's going to keep you together? Well, not surprisingly, the answer is Jesus. Look at it again. He says this. So... If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. In other words, why should you work so hard to stay together? Why put in the effort to forgive when it's just so much simpler to walk away? Why keep calling the other person even though they won't answer? Why work through the disagreement and try to find a compromise when just dividing would be easier? Why spend so much time and effort and sacrifice and energy and risk to try to maintain that relationship when everything in the world and a lot of stuff inside of you and even people that you care about tell you, you don't need to do that. Your feelings matter more and, and you know that even if you work it out, something else is going to happen. Why put in all the effort? Why work so hard? Well, the reason that is given is simply this. Ask yourself, how does Jesus treat you? When you were difficult and discouraged and complaining and selfish, how did Jesus treat you? Well, he encouraged you. He, he met you in your misery. He sat with you. He lifted you up. See, he didn't have to. He's God. He does not need you in his life. He is perfectly, su he is perfectly sufficient unto himself, and he, he gets nothing from you by taking all that time to work with you. To all that time to comfort you and be patient with you and heal you and forgive you. and He gains nothing because he needs nothing. But he does it anyway because he has chosen to love you. Despite your miserable nature, he loves you anyway. And so Paul says, if you've ever been encouraged by Jesus, go encourage others. And the next reason is this. If you've ever felt comfort from love. In other words... If you've ever felt the love of God, if you've ever experienced the Heavenly Father's loving arms wrapped around you, if you've ever been in that terrible, scary, miserable, difficult situation, but you had a peace that passes understanding, you had this joy that came out of nowhere in the middle of your trials that you could not explain other than to know that that was God being with you, saying, I will take care of you. If you've ever felt God's love coming to you when you knew you least deserved it, when you were in the misery of your sin, in the depth of your betrayal, the cost of your salvation, knowing that it cost the blood of Jesus Christ, if you've ever felt that kind of love, the love that ran red for you, love others in the same way. Next he says this, if you have any participation in the Spirit, this is a more spiritual reason. It basically means if you have realized that you are united with God in a special way, more than in mind, more than emotion, but there's this deep 
an intimate spiritual connection between you and God. And that everyone around you, every Christian around you, has the exact same spirit, the same connection, that you have that in common with them, this eternal bond to Jesus. If you know that you are an adopted son or daughter of God through the power of his spirit, see others as well as having that same connection. You're not just part of the same church. You don't just believe the same things. You're united to these people around you on this deeper level than emotion, and you're going to be with them for eternity. That's a good reason to get along today, because you are united in the spirit. And finally, he says, if you have any affection and sympathy, another translation would say, if you have any tenderness and compassion. In other words, after God exchanged your heart of stone for a heart of flesh, and he gave you a new way to see and experience the world through his eyes, to feel a bit how he feels, if God's worked in your heart in, a, in the way that he has changed you from selfish and self-centered to someone that actually cares for others, that can actually feel their pain and wants to do something about it, then don't just use that as motivation to do good works for the world, but turn that compassion toward your fellow believers, toward your family, toward your church, toward the people that are closest to you but seem to annoy you the most. Have the same compassion for them, the same empathy for them, the same concern for them that you would have with an unbelieving stranger. Why would you grant the world such grace and patience and kindness, but then not do the same for your brother and sister in Christ, not do the same for the people that's closest to you? You see, the point I want to make today is this. The whole world is trying to draw you away from people that you love and people that love you from people you've committed yourself to and have committed themselves to you and from gathering together as believers the world's trying to pull it all apart and it takes a lot of work to maintain those partnerships maintain the friendships the family the marriages and your christian family too but you got to do the work why why should a Christian work so hard to maintain relationships when it takes so much effort, energy, frustration, and time? The best reason I can give, and it's the one that Paul did, do it because that's what Jesus has done for you. He's done so much more for you, and you want to respect that. You want to respect what he's done, honor what he's done, imitate what he's done for you by doing the same thing for others.